It's been more than a year since the COVID-19 outbreak. The pandemic has created an unprecedented global health crisis. It's time to look back on how our healthcare and life sciences coped with the uncertain times. It's also time to look at the future. It is time to recalibrate. It's time to act. Health of India is a series of high-profile power-packed virtual summits bringing together more than 50 speakers from across India. Throughout these summits, health ministers, policy makers, top CEOs, thought leaders and technologists will initiate a new dialogue with focus on innovation, technology and policy making. Join the conversation as we respond to recover from and reimagine the future. beyond the current global health crisis health of india time to reimagine the future thank you so much a very good morning to you all i think it's the perfect line to begin with health of india it's time to reimagine the future and this is the tagline that we are starting a really warm welcome to all our participants all our speakers here for the health of india maharashtra e summit um i take this privilege and honor to in, to thank you all i know it's it's a very very busy schedule for all our guests for all our speakers but thank you so much for joining this really really important discussion i know for the last couple of years we've been facing i think uh, one more than over in a uh, year and a half we've been facing the covid-19 pandemic all of us have been really really badly affected by it, some way or the other so we thought that this discussion right now is really really important so with that let's start our day uh, allow me a minute to share my screen perfect here we are so this is the health of india maharashtra e summit series this is actually a series that we will do in the eight states across india we starting with the maharashtra today it's been uh, more than a year into the covid-19 pandemic and it's now time to take take stock of how healthcare and life sciences have managed to cope with the stress and with and discuss strategies actually that have been developed to address the gaps and maybe vulnerabilities you know that were witnessed during the covid-19 pandemic the pandemic actually has created an unprecedented situation and a very very uncertain time in terms of global health uh, across but it has also at the same time created new opportunities for future partnership towards robust solutions in healthcare and life sciences it's time right now like we started it's time right now to reimagine the future and the time to act is right now a line of introduction here my name is surbhi pandit nangia and i'm the director outreach and partnership with data leads on behalf of team data leads health analytics asia and our esteemed partners here sap and ntd data business solutions i extend a warm welcome to all our esteemed speakers and guests for the health of india summit and we hope that you will continue to join us uh, for the other series as well this why are we here today we've been attending a lot of webinars we've been online for the last so, couple of years or so but why are we here today the health of india series which is presented by sap and ntt data business solutions is convened by health analytics asia and hosted by data leads as part of a pan asia health dialogue initiative to build a committed platform for strategic collaborations in the ever evolving areas of health and life sciences this series the entire series will feature health ministers policy makers top ceos thought leaders technologists journalists as participants in high level deliberations on health with specific focus on innovation technology and policy making This series, like I said, is spread over eight states. The series will highlight pivotal perspectives of the states that drive India forward, promising to shape the country's uh, healthcare and life sciences ecosystem in the years to come. You know, so that we don't face the problems uh, that we faced because of the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic that happened in the last year and a half. 
up here. So it's, it's time to discuss and take the conversation forward. Before I move any further, I would want to take a moment to introduce Data Leads. Data Leads is a digital media and information company which aims to help people understand and also engage with the world around them. We work with the world's leading media and tech companies and regularly partner with them in various collaborative initiatives that we've been doing for the last few years. Our work spectrum actually varies. Uh, it includes capacity building initiatives, fact-checking initiatives, media research, data-driven content, and events with a special focus on building collaborations with specifically on public health. We are also very proud partners of Google News Initiative and Internews in launching and pioneering actually information literacy and fact-checking initiatives in India, which has benefited over 1,100 newsrooms, uh, uh, organizations, and 700 plus universities, education institutes across India. We started the Google News Initiative program actually in 2018, uh, where we chose 250 journalists and media educators, uh, and we equipped them with basic skills required to fact-check any kind of information. And ever since this, program has been, has been running uh, uh, very, very effectively. Health Analytics Asia, this is another flagship project of Data Leads, is Asia's first, actually, and it gives me immense uh, uh, pleasure to say that it's Asia's first data-driven health information platform, building collaboration between journalists, doctors, and technologists. Our approach to build collaboration with doctors is globally recognized as a unique initiative in healthcare reporting. And it has won, in fact, the membership puzzle project by the New York University. We've also been awarded by the prestigious BMJ Awards. We are really, really proud of it. There is another initiative that is really, really dear to us, which is uh, uh, an integral part of eHealth Analytics Asia. And it is called First Check. It's the entire uh, entire map that you see in here is there are our, 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 our collaborations with the doctors across Asia. In fact, it's moved ahead uh, of Asia. This is a collaborative initiative with doctors to fight the tide of misinformation related to public health. So any kind of misinformation that comes on any of the social media platforms, these panel of doctors uh, help to debunk it. It has recently been selected as one of the seven fact-checking initiatives that will benefit the broader global fact-checking ecosystem by the Fact-Checking Innovation Initiative, which is a joint venture between the Facebook Journalism Project and the International Fact-Checking Network at the Pointer Institute. So let's begin the day here. Uh, we know it's there has been uh, uh, you know an online fatigue and keeping in consideration that people have been going online and you know we've been already zooming and and meeting online for a long time so we thought let's uh, uh, keep this session uh, as crisp uh, and as uh, as focused as possible so the agenda is very clear is very crisp we start with one panel discussion uh, we have our eminent panelist already here with us we move on to a 5 minute Whole, uh, survey and then followed by a session on flash talks. We will start, we've started exactly at 10 o'clock and we will try and wrap it exactly at 12 o'clock. We understand, we respect uh, that your time is important. Uh, so thank you so much once again for joining us. And this gives me immense pleasure and pride. Here is our, uh, the entire panelist who are here with us today. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to set up the stage for the first panel discussion. Ideally, in an ideal circumstance, you know, we would have done this in person. We would have come up on stage, uh, meet, uh, met all of you in person, including our speakers here. But uh, the COVID-19 situation actually doesn't permit us. But nevertheless, I think we would make the best of the situation that we are in here today. So I would like to thank all our eminent speakers for the two important sessions and for taking out the time to be a part of the series and discuss the future of health. It is really, really important for our participants and all of us present here today. For the Maharashtra East Summit, five leading voices with expertise ranging from healthcare to pharma to global health to COVID-19 management will actually share their ideas and vision about the challenges and new opportunities ahead. The plenary session will be followed by a flash talk presentations delivered by health trailblazers on exploring new avenues, taking calculated risk and setting up the stage for recovery. And we are so hopeful about that. 
thank you so much uh, with that i would want to uh, introduce our eminent panel who are present here today to begin with uh, i would want to invite and introduce dr subhash salunke dr salunke is currently the advisor in covid 19 to the government of maharashtra he also serves as senior advisor health system support unit at the public health foundation of india dr salunke navigated various portfolios in public health and has assisted governments to initiate a number of schemes focusing on health services to the poorer section of the society which is really really important he was actively involved in formulating projects such as health system development for specifically maharashtra and has led the design of the hiv aids control special program which was called evert with the assistance of us aid for maharashtra thank you so much dr salunke for joining us today uh, i know it's, it's extremely busy right now but we really really appreciate the time that you've taken out with that i would now want to introduce mr sanjeev deshpande sanjeev deshpande is a board member and managing director and ceo of entity data business solutions india he has over 26 years of diverse and rich experience including 6 years of management experience in the field of industry with almost 20 years of experience in the it industry with this strategic leadership and his skills as well as deep business and industry skills sanjeev is a proven technology and digital solutions coach thank you so much sanjeev uh, for partnering with us and also being present uh, for this very important panel discussion thank you again moving on to our uh, next speaker i would want to introduce him uh, dr altaf lal that was a public health specialist based in USA dr altaf is the senior advisor for the global health and innovations at san pharma he is member of the rollback malaria partnership board rbm asia pacific leaders malaria alliance and advisor to the board member foundation for disease elimination and control of india he has served as the director of fda india office and us health attache and regional representative for south asia at the us embassy in india dr lal has also worked towards building a bilateral and multilateral partnerships which has led to significant growth in collaborations at academic institutional industry and at the government levels that's a lot of great work that you've done dr lal thank you so much uh, for joining us and for coordinating with all this thank you so much i now take uh, the opportunity of introducing our next eminent panelist for this session uh, mr anna swami vedish uh, mr vedish has a track record of over 35 years in healthcare and fmcg industries in multi countries actually which is focusing on sustainable and responsible growth currently is the ceo of north star alliance north star asia llp management consultant and senior advisor to many companies ka company which includes the pag holdings hong kong uh, mr vedish uh, was also previously the managing uh, director and vp south asia at the global sleep time and md of johnson and johnson medical south asia and vp of asia pacific diabetes franchise Uh, he signed this is something really important he signed and executed the mou with china communist party school for healthcare initiatives for johnson and johnson he is the honorary fellow of the millennium access surgeons association of india thank you so much mr vedish for joining us today uh, i also actually wanted to introduce we had another panelist uh, who of course needs uh, uh, no introduction we want we uh, we were joined we were supposed to, dr naresh trihan was supposed to join us today but something really really urgent came up came up and uh, he couldn't join this panel discussion uh, dr naresh trihan is the chairman and managing director of medanta the medicity but i'm sure we would find an opportunities in the series to come that dr trihan would be able to join us uh, but thank you so much uh, i understand you know because this is a, a, a time where all of us are actually Uh, you know fighting it's this to the entire panel here have been fighting the covid 19 so we understand that something could come up with that i would request my colleague sayed nazakat who's the founder 
and team lead of Data Leads to take the conversation forward uh, uh, on this panel discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarvi. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much uh, for introducing the panel and setting the stage for this really important discussion at a very unprecedented situation. You know, I, I, I personally strongly believe that no matter how hard the situation gets, there is a solution to every problem the humans face throughout the history. There has been no problem in the world, but there's no solution. But the challenge often comes the people who know the solution, either they don't talk or when they talk, people do not listen to them. So the whole uh, concept behind this summit essentially is to bring the major thinkers, the prominent people with expertise, uh, people with uh, who have been in the field, who have, who, have, who have led the partnerships and discussions, to bring them closer on this very important discussion. Because um, we were having a chat before the session with Dr. Subhash, and as I said, we never ever imagined that we will face a situation like this. And uh, I remember, uh, just to put a quick note at the start, I remember when it happened in Wuhan, and there was a first outbreak, we have a Chinese colleague with data leaves, and we were meeting in Delhi and I was asking her, what is this happening in Wuhan? There's some virus. And we reported, I think our data lease was perhaps the first company to report the outbreak and what was happening in Wuhan because of our Chinese colleagues there. And we have no idea that it will become such a global you know, crisis and tragedy and all. But I think we still, no matter how it, hard it becomes, uh, if we think of future, we need to talk. And we need to listen also to people who know the answers and who know the right questions. So this whole dialogue series is an effort to bring the brightest minds together and have a new discussion about moving forward. So I can, I can, um, if I if I ask my panelists um, to start with like a maybe opening a couple of short remarks about what do you think, where do we stand after more than a year of COVID? And whether you, what, what are the challenges you think we still face in terms of moving forward in next five, six months, which are very crucial. We're in the middle of massive vaccination drive as well. So if I start with Dr. Subhash with you, you're advising the Maharashtra government and you have been a forefront of actually leading this initiative in, in one of the India's major states. What, how do you see the situation now and what do you think has been our key learning in the last, more than one year. Uh, Dr. Subhash, your microphone is off. If you... uh, am I audible to you now? Yes, yes sir. Uh, yes, sir. So I wish to thank all of you for uh, giving me an opportunity to express some of my views. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, you have indicated that what is likely to happen in the next five, six months particularly from the perspective of Maharashtra. I'm sure all of you will agree it is not Maharashtra can be considered as a standalone entity. It has to be linked to the nation and to the global situation. I anticipate in Maharashtra the uh, areas, just all of you are aware Maharashtra is as big as many or bigger than many countries, so 130 million population in huge area. I mean, every sort of an coastal area, tribal area, everything you name it and it is there. So it's a huge state. But within that state, you find that Western Maharashtra districts are continuously showing upward trend or it is not showing downward trend as we are seeing in other regions of Maharashtra. Like we have seen a decline in Mumbai, decline in Pune, but that decline is not seen in Kolapur, Sangli, Satara, that's the point of worry. Uh, just a couple of days back, we had a meeting with the Honorable Chief Minister in DC with all the district collectors and uh, officials of the administration. So I I indicated to him, sir, I said, sir, Maharashtra at this juncture seem to be going into the direction of what we call as an city. We are not going to see a decline to the desired level throughout the state as some of you are anticipating, it won't be zero ever, at, no, sorry, not a, ever, it won't be zero in the near future, but it is certainly going to remain downward trend in some districts, and it will not be that downward trend in some districts, and it might plateau 
and if it is going to go upward then that's the point of worry what will save us according to me only to is not only for maharashtra is true for the india if we do not vaccinate at least 65 to 70 percent population by two doses throughout the india at least by december december is late this is what i told the national level colleagues i said december is late we should have been able to do accomplish this by august but even if we accomplish this by december end things will be under control this is one and foremost intervention that needs to be done and second one is that for god sake irrespective of whether we vaccinate 60 65 70 absolutely no choice but to implement the covid appropriate behavior no choice in maharashtra our recommendations to the honorable cm and deputy cm is that please do not relax the restrictions abruptly as it has been done in some states like in delhi i'm i'm very unhappy with the way things have happened in delhi so abruptly and i'm sure it is likely to give a backfire effect after some time that's my anticipation if i'm proved wrong i will be the most happy person but no abrupt kind of relaxation gradually taking into consideration what situation is there district wise districts are also quite fairly big like pune we have uh, 1 crore 30 lakh population that is uh, you know huge bigger than uh, some of the country so the point that i'm trying to say we need to take into consideration the challenges that we are facing and the major challenge we are going to face is is not only covid we have to also take into consideration non covid activities our immunization program right, right. but you know program or the diseases which are coming in the in this particular rainy season so health systems are already overburdened they are already under stress under duress and now we are going to get uh, you know sort of a possibility of pediatric age group getting more affected so i think we are really doing fire fighting but if we have a balanced approach we will be able to contain the present challenge in next 6 months provided these two three principles are followed thank you Do, do, uh, Dr. Altaf Lal, how, how do you see what is our biggest challenge right now in the current situation? Uh, your microphone, uh, Dr. Altaf Lal. Yeah. I uh, say it, and so be. Let me also mm-hmm. first thank you for hosting this, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I wanted to go a step back uh, before we got started. We were talking about the Spanish flu, the nineteen eighteen pandemic. i think like 1918 1919 19, we have some commonalities with today's pandemic as well uh, but we're better informed um, we are better communicating with each other compared to then and we're challenging each other better um, but in that context i wanted to bring up certain key structures processes and elements that if we combine and address together we might have a better outcome at subhash what subhash said was a fact based communication if i summarize what subhash said the people on one side who are affected they live in different demographics in different economic strata rural semi urban urban providers of healthcare these are clinician who know how to treat a individual at a time then you got public health professionals like subhash they look at communities they look at states they look at provinces they look at countries and they all think differently then you have producers of medical products i think we're fortunate that diagnostic tests were created in rapid time frame repurposing of drugs was undertaken vaccines were put in people's arms within 2 years of start of programs we have not seen that anywhere at any time the policy makers who have to listen to people like subhash who have to understand how to communicate maharashtra communication has to be in marathi it has to be in gujarati it has to be in urdu it has to be in hindi and many south indian languages because maharashtra mumbai is a melting pot of many different cultures many different backgrounds in the last piece is the political leaders i'm so happy subhash said he talked to the chief minister the deputy chief minister or the health ministers it's at the end of this this chain of peas i described is your political leaders if they do not communicate in an honest manner repeatedly 
in a manner that people understand. I'm going to give you the example of Delhi situation with oxygen. You know, when I was in the U.S., we, there were multiple messages. We have oxygen was coming from one the political arm of the Indian government. The other arm was saying, we don't have oxygen. Well, you either have oxygen or you don't have oxygen. You can have both. So this real-time communication that's factual is absolutely critical. Talking to each other versus talking with each other. So those are my initial observations, Sayyid. Let me come to uh, Sanjeev, to you actually. Looking at the challenge, it was also a technological challenge actually. And there are learnings how actually technology played some role here and could play better in the future. How do you see the challenges in terms of actually use of technology in a crisis like COVID? Thank you, Sayyid. And um, again, thank you all the panelists. The technology, this, the, the shining example is Covaxin. So if you look at the Covaxin, the platform that got created in India, more or less is the one that was developed by SAP uh, along with the very large telecom company in Germany. So Covaxin, and you uh, all also now heard the news that it is being released to uh, the rest of the world, anybody who wants to use it. That platform has shown us what is possible in terms of integrating the data across multiple hospitals, across multiple districts, multiple states of the country. Imagine if we had this integrated data analytics system beforehand, five people in five different hospitals were reporting the same symptoms that could have helped us predict the outbreak of a pandemic much quicker, but we didn't have that in place. We have acted after the fact, but nevertheless, the speed with which it was developed is amazing. Today, we are vaccinating the people. How do we make sure that now we are reaching the right people, the people who have not been vaccinated, where to emphasize, uh, you know, put our focus? All of that is possible because of the co-vaccine platform or platforms like that. Arugya Setu app is another shining example of what is possible in terms of protecting people in, in times like this. But if I... Okay, now this pandemic at some point will be over, right? And as Subhas Salankeji said, uh, by December, if we are able to vaccinate most of our people, at least 60 to 70% of our people, then probably we will be out of it. But then what happens after that? If you look at our primary, secondary, and tertiary care systems, every one of these today is extremely overloaded, and it will continue to be overloaded if you look at the statistics uh, and compare ourselves with the rest of the world. From that perspective, the remote consultation, video consultations, telemed telepathy or the telemedicine are uh, pass made possible through robotics automation. Data being read by AI, ML. So you do a lot of right prognosis and diagnosis as you are you know, analyzing the data. So our ability to expand the reach of the medical supervision monitoring is going to be much higher if we adopt the right technology and which is going to be necessity today and which is going to be most necessity probably after the, you know, after the pandemic is over because people are getting more and more conscious about health and viruses, I don't think you know it's going to get over in, uh, by end of December. I think it's going to continue to mutate probably with us for the next three, four years. From that perspective, it is an urgent need to have an integrated data platform across the country put in place much sooner so it might take another you know, few months to put that together, but I think we need to invest in because Covaxin just to track the vaccination is not going to be enough. I think we need to be able to get the data across hospitals and bring them onto one single dashboard. Wonderful. That should happen. Uh, wonderful. Vedish, if I come to you, you know, you know, given your experience of you know working across the region and you know working at different leadership levels, and then seeing also the situation of the last two years globally, we're all in actually. What do you think overall, why do we stand even, as a, even at a national or global level in terms of our fight with the COVID? How do, how do you see the situation in the next couple of months? What could be like our key challenges here? Uh, thank you, Syed. And uh, I must say, first and foremost, thanks very much for this August uh, panel uh, with such great wisdom out there. Uh, 
a couple of points i would say is that i think the title that you talked about the reimagine the future actually the covid has already made us to reimagine the future uh, as dr altaf has just mentioned um, there is a unprecedented work that is being done by almost many members of the ecosystem i could never imagine a drug discovery happening in a matter of one and a half years time i have been in the industry for uh, donkey's years uh, i know for sure that what it takes it takes more than 8 to 10 years to get a drug here we are talking about getting a vaccine out and very interesting thing is that a concept like mrna technology platform which has been in in the fray for the last 25 years and this whole mindset of making things happen people wanting to try because the pandemic has made us all to think very differently so first thing that i would say is that the landscape of healthcare has changed dramatically forever the whole concept of collaboration amongst the stakeholders has gone up leaps and bounds now no longer each one of the members and the payers don't look at a provider as a uh, as an adversary or a regulator doesn't think the pharma company is an adversary today we are seeing an unprecedented collaboration trust and people are willing to give in thing which would not normally happen so first and foremost i would say that whatever bad thing has happened as covid because people have lost their life at the same time i would say we have made a significant progress as a solution that we can bring in future uh, and solve the future uh, uh, pandemics a couple of uh, uh, so i would say that we should congratulate ourselves uh, country like india people used to say we have a very different healthcare system as compared to developed countries healthcare system which is ours is a far more uh, supply uh, a driven uh, financing mechanism some countries have a demand and supply side financing combined and uh, each one of them had a very advanced so called advanced sub- dealing with the chronic diseases look at the way it's india has responded frankly in my opinion everybody is in the same stage but india has also stepped up and frankly in my opinion example of maharashtra was given what kind of innovation that we are doing to deal with so first and foremost we need to recognize before we start saying that what we should be doing i think what we have done is phenomenal so i would like to recognize before i uh, leave couple of thoughts which we can pick it up later first and foremost now i think it's time for us to look at how can we prevent uh take certain action because the patients or the public is ready they are listening uh policy holders are listening this is a time for us to ramp up a uh, huge preventive healthcare program in place i have few suggestions that i'll talk about as we go along but i think this is the right time start putting some such powerful programs and enroll our population into those programs wonderful thank you so much i think this really well said to be honest you know like unprecedented situation but it has also thrown out some insight which could really empower us as we move forward i think one of the key things uh, you know in the whole discussion is also i think the data the health data and access and collection and understanding of their data so that our policies at the end of day are driven by evidence and i will come back to you dr subhash you know like you have been advising the maharashtra government why does the uh, data you know fit in the picture how uh, is really policy driven by evidences of the ground i know uh, you have been one of the i think the uh, very first person who was able to identify the second wave in maharashtra but somehow i think the Uh, the, the the message was not picked up so what role do you see in the future of health of how data should actually help us to take better decisions yeah uh, i think sir your microphone is uh, yes yes the data is the foundation and that is appreciated by everyone i'm so delighted that in a district like pune the rural area the most peripheral functionary whether it is the community health officer of a sub center or anm or an asha they are now aware about the importance of the data appropriate entry as per as the data is concerned so basically decision making now in maharashtra is totally given by the objective data collection and interpretation 
that great achievement has happened because of you know as dr deshpande mr deshpande has indicated covid came into picture and we had initially lot of problems but that now has got stabilized and that is the anchor sheet as far as the decision making is concerned uh, covid now one more thing that is happening because of this you know all other programs maharashtra is one of the states where the disease surveillance program has been established quite early and now the use of electronic media even a simple tool like uh, uh, android mobile phone with the asha and anm has become a very critical issue as far as communication of the data is concerned and revalidation reverification everything is being done without being used these terminologies and people are using it on the ground that's the beauty of this entire thing maharashtra is also uh, benefited because of two extreme uh, you know important political policy decisions taken at the highest level with the chief minister like you know he said do not hide any death rate absolutely no hiding don't hide number of cases don't hide deaths don't hide complications absolutely so you're, so you're saying there's a clear political message absolutely. to you and the uh, people please everyone we are like i won't say exceptional there are other states also but in maharashtra maybe when you see that oh so many cases oh so many deaths we are absolutely crystal clear and reporting is no hidden sort of there is no agenda to hide any data and that is the reason whatever is being presented today and the national platform or international platform maharashtra can with confidence say that we have a fair amount of accuracy and as i explained data is generated at the most peripheral level its importance is appreciated and it is also being used for decision making at the district at the divisional and at the state level that's that's very positive point wonderful i think that's COVID. good that's good to hear actually from someone who really is advising government and keeping the data as a foundation i know dr altaf lal you have spent most of your life actually with data as a public health policy advocate with malaria with so many other initiatives globally and i i, I just wanted to know how do you see the use of data and the evidence essentially in terms of uh the pharma how they reacted to covid particularly you know we saw vaccines we saw clinical tri- you know trials going at a un, un, un you know unprecedented scale and speed what has been the learning with particularly with the pharma in terms of data sayed i just wanted to follow up where, uh, where subhash left uh, by saying data is gold in public health you have good data you got a lot of good gold to work with you got bad data you have nothing so i'm so pleased subhash you mentioning that the honorable chief minister is directing to get the real data out it's only when you have the real data you can make real policy decisions i think covid may be teaching us something within the confines of india and perhaps other countries that get the real data out we fight this absence of good data in malaria in tb in uh, you know chronic diseases so at the end of the day it, it, the published data is you only have 20000 deaths because of disease a one policy makers say well is it really worth investing significant amount of resources human resources money etc cetera, etc cetera, when the numbers are low and pharmaceutical sector at the same time takes a view where do we invest public money because pharmaceutical sector also uses your money where would we impact the best public health for a disease which has lots of cases lots of death etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm so happy that covid may be actually advising policy makers political leaders to be transparent to be honest and to be upfront uh, when globally Uh, and i i say this from the perspectives of what i have picked of india but outside india um the the information would be well 300000 deaths but it could be three times 300000 it could be 10 times so this could has to disappear mm-hmm. maharashtra has to lead this effort and other states have to convene similar strategies that 
if we report 10,000 cases, it could be 10,000 plus 20 or 10,000 minus 20. It can't be 20 to 60 to 70. So Subhash, kudos to you. Kudos to government of Maharashtra. And this is Sayyid where Maharashtra and other states that are on similar things could take the lead and have a nation that is based on facts, nations back based on data. Sanjeev, Sanjeev, how do you see, you deal with data, your company deals with data, you provide solutions. How do you see actually the challenges in terms of data collection and making sense of, the, the, you know, because we have seen in India, you know, the, the data is in, is in silos. And we, know, and we have a data in different languages, in different formats. And one of the major reasons why we do not have still a lot of, uh, you know, like action and planning on based on data, because it's not really at one place somewhere down the line, though we have a session in the second half, we're going to launch something very special today at the end of the summit. But I, I just want to come back to you and take your you know, insight. What are the challenges you see in terms of making really data as, as our, you know, like a, as a principle moving forward in terms of public health and life sciences? Right. So um, as Mr. Subhash Salanke said, if the nurses, the staff, the primary, you know, healthcare or, you know, whatever hospitals, if they're collecting the data of who is coming, their age, their, their gender, uh, the symptoms, that's fantastic. But then what happens after that, right? So there are two or three different sets of data that needs to be collected. We in India, electronic medical records, for example, are not even available between the two different facilities of the same hospital chain. Government hospitals are totally disjoined from each other. So let's say we collect the data. I mean, I come from a small town um, in, in Telangana, which is bordering Maharashtra. And we know the situation uh, actually on both sides. Um, tremendous improvement over the last 20 years and a lot of good things are happening. Nevertheless, do we have the type of the hospital management systems in each hospital, which potentially could be then linked over a you know, what I call a cloud uh, system of data analytics that will then help us do advanced analytics on that or some do some kind of predictive analytics because we have the data, but then how do you derive the insight from data? Because you have a lot of data, absolutely fantastic. But what do you do with that data? The data can be overwhelming if you don't have the right tools to mine the data and derive the right information. So in my mind, the, this, the focus has to be, yes, first of all, we need to collect the data, all types of data, not just the patient statistics, but then what is happening with the patient what type of treatments, what type of symptoms, what type of drugs are being prescribed and what is happening after the no prescription of the drugs. That would help pharma companies understand the effectiveness of the medication that is being given. It will also help you know, change the course of the treatments. Today, a lot of that is happening. Of course, no ICMR and other bodies are collecting the data, but it is not happening seamlessly across different hospitals. That's why you would see if you go to one state, one hospital, you might get slightly different treatment for the same thing if you go to some other hospital. I think there's a lot of good things that are happening, but I think we need to go to an all out, collect all the data. It's not just the patient incoming checking outs, but I think the, during the course of the treatment also, a lot of data just get, gets generated. If you go to, let's say for the hospitals in US or Germany, other developed nations, through variables, through smartwatches, through sensors, there's a lot of data just being collected on an individual itself so that they are able to you know, fine tune the customize the treatment just for that individual. In fact, the individuals are being connected to the healthcare even before they show up at the hospital store. So the preventive care is so good that actually relays the load on the hospital system. So from that perspective, individual data plus the data from the, at the hospital level, regional level, district level needs to be collected in all aspects, need to be integrated into a district level, state level, and nationwide platform. Otherwise, we will not be able to drive the right data analytics. I think, you know, you know, Germany, for example, we, along with SAP, there are some certain states, you know, where there is such platform that exists. A lot of good data mining is happening, and they're able to derive some very good insight from that data. Wonderful. I, I, let me, let me uh, you know, come back, come back to Videsh, to you, actually, in terms of, you know, we, when we look at future and we look at the data, uh, we also see there has been a change in our own understanding because data can actually tell us something is going to happen if we have access to right data. And there has been, a, I think, a larger global consensus somewhere down the line that eventually we have to put more focus on preventive health, preventive medicine. 
and instead of treating and doing surgeries, what about making sure that people do not fall sick? And I think during the COVID, there has been a lot of discussion about, you know, how people with diabetes became more vulnerable, how people with other ailments became more vulnerable. And there's a new talk and discussion about the future of health that perhaps we need to be more preventive driven actually in terms of moving ahead. How do you see actually the role of data or technology? Oh, of course, policy is certainly out there, but how, what kind of framework you see in next five, 10 years for India where the preventive medicine plays actually critical role in the larger you know, dialogue and debate and policy making on healthcare? Well, well Syed, no. uh, what uh, uh, Sanjeev said is absolutely the way in which you do uh, deliver uh, healthcare to the population, you know, but however, we need to recognize one of the ch fundamental challenge that we have in our country, yeah, and which we are getting resolved through this pandemic. Fundamentally, you need to remember ours is not an integrated healthcare system, which many people don't understand. In most of the developed countries, a payer, provider, policy makers, playmakers, physicians, they're all linked to one central system where people know what is their accountability, what they are supposed to do, where is the technology assessment, there is a reimbursement happened to the technology, the standard of care is being discussed, and everybody knows who's going to get what. And the patient also knows the kind of standard of care he will get. And there is a very clear-cut patient care pathway. Now, Unfortunately, the way in which the India has emerged, we followed a very different model where we allow, you know, what I call it as a primary and tertiary and secondary care is at a, uh, what I call the PHC, CHC, district headquarter hospital, general hospitals. Now, you, we will have a data from a government-centered hospital. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, since the early 90s, Private healthcare has significantly moved and started playing a very big role. But the unfortunate is that the data doesn't capture get anywhere. There's so much care has been done by private healthcare, but each of them are delivering the data remains with them. Like what you just said, somebody is going for a hernia uh, procedure and that person goes for a redo to another doctor. So the data is not there at all. And what devices somebody used, why it happens. So one of the uh, silver lining that I'm seeing, uh, I will take Maharashtra government as an example. I think the way in which they did this integration of the system, where I know that they captured the private hospital, government, all the data in one center, and they knew exactly how many beds are there, where, and what oxygen is required, what medicine is required, data central procurement. Now, this is a very big start for integration of a good healthcare system. Today, if you go to Maharashtra government, they will, as, as uh, Dr. Subhash said, that the ever data and transparency comes in big time, right? Now, it's not a no fault of others. Others are not doing it. It's just that we need to encourage the integration of system for the benefit of the overall benefit of the country and to the patient. And then what Sanjeev talked about, all the analytics can be done. You can exactly know the load which disease is having what problem? Like, for example, I was talking to the Cancer Society. Now, we have some good data available. Like, for example, JNK as a typical gastric cancer. Tamil Nadu will have more hepatic cancer. Like, each state has got a specific incidence of cancer. So, you have a data. And you know very well how to respond to the data. And as a country, we will be able to respond to certain situation out there. So, I'm a strong believer I think this will help in even drug discovery. Amount of data that each, uh, in fact, I sit on the Health Insurance Council and they have so much of data, millions of uh, insured people data available, how much they are reimbursing. But if you really look at the slice and dicing of the data, there is no healthcare people are doing the data, but they are doing it to underwrite the risk, right? For From an actuarial perspective. But if you integrate, payer, provider, physician, everybody has an access to a common data. Imagine the power of it. The data is the new oil. And as Sanjay said, that it's something that we need to push ahead and make sure, take the help of people like Dr. Subhash Salonke, who's, who's, you know, 
definitely has done some great job in the in the integration of various players in the system how did they do it because there are forces that not allow it to happen so my uh, one suggestion is that and the one which i wanted to leave the thought is one of the biggest challenge that you will find in most of the admissions are related to pneumonia even i was looking at the insurance data right most of the, the hospital admission finally end up in pneumonia but today we have a vaccine for pneumococcal vaccine right it's available right now at the door of india my uh, encourage i will encourage at least the vulnerable population to start looking at vaccinating and having the data in our apps right how many people have been vaccinated with the pneumococcal which will prevent a further sig- significant uh, healthcare hazard related to various viral uh, stuff that is going to happen now and also in the future so this is something which uh, i have enough data on that as i spoke to the companies like pfizer and brilliant stuff is happening in the area as a preventive vaccine is something that we need to start looking at and so that the the intensity of incident that we had the spikes we could manage because pandemic is something management of spike is essential more than management of the virus itself right so right. this is something one big suggestion i leave that here uh, for take away and of course there are more details can be discussed at a much later stage wonderful uh, dr aldaf wants to make a point i also request our audience and participants in case they have a question they can drop that in the chat box and my colleague sorbi will read those questions at the end of session in next 10 minutes yes dr aldaf Thank you so much, Sayed. I just wanted to follow up. Um, it's an important point uh, that Subhash made, uh, which is on the burden of pandemic at this time. Um, we have a single-stranded virus that's causing this chaos, and they mutate. So it shouldn't shock us at any level, public health level, practitioners level. Certainly, they need to inform the policymakers and political leaders. Mutations will emerge independently. the mutants will disperse mutants that are biologically fit will transmit faster and exponentially the disease will grow so therefore the need while we reach and try to reach the 60 70% till december of vaccine coverage preventive controls have to go hand in hand mask wearing has to be there physical distancing has to be there hand washing has to be there i just wanted your listeners to keep that in mind um the vaccine by itself at 60% 70% coverage is not going to be absolutely the answer because we also know that efficacy of vaccine and effectiveness of vaccine could be 70 80 85 90% there's always going to be these gaps and disparities then in which population is getting vaccine versus which population is not getting vaccine over wonderful i i will come to you dr subhash now actually with another question you know i was thinking about we having this discussion about technology data future we can't ignore the fact that we are still a poor country and there are millions of millions of people who just do not have access to basic health so i was i was just just wondering moving forward looking at the future what are the things we can do to address the huge gap access to healthcare and that's again the future and again i can see technology playing tremendous role out there but uh, dr sparsh what do you think of course you can make your point with uh, dr aldaf was saying but my next question to you will be essentially about how can we address the gap of access to healthcare to large section of the population which really is actually living uh, without any 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 possibility of medical attention often thank you uh, as a matter of fact i just wanted to uh make a comment you know um we are a wonderful country we are a wonderful country and our health system is also wonderful because there are no legislations to govern it that is the problem and the issue that was brought out by mr anna swami and that the no integration there was a concept under the public health act or a law irrespective whether you are in the private sector you are in the public sector there will be compulsion on reporting information that is needed of the issues which are of public health importance what they are that is to be decided however in india 
because health is a state subject excepting 14 states even the basic basic simple clinical establishment act is also not promulgated and that is one of the reason why the data for both generation collection interpretation analysis and implementation is absolutely confused because there is no standardization national level i was chairing a committee of what is called the task force to develop a model public health act we have done great work six years it was with the help of the law school of bangalore it was worked out and finally it is supposed to be in the ministry six years so if there would have been any act of public health making it compulsion on the you know all players then i think things would have been better i hope we will see the light of the day but now coming back to your question yes yeah yeah coming back to your question how do we meet the gaps and i think that unfortunately the question which is lingering for last 70 years with our governments and no government has been able to find the solution even though on paper it is supposed to be there if you look at our you know the structure with which the indian health system has been designed health services have been designed right from the board committee to the most recent national health policy of 2017 if there would have been a seriousness on the part of government of india and the state government to implement that nhp 2017 in its entirety which is addressing all the issues with the gaps those who are likely to be you know really what we have and not have what kind of and services and what level services need to be worked out what human resources are needed what drugs diagnostics are needed i can tell you we know how you know how to go about it what needs to be done the problem Dr. is about Subhan, implementation is there, is there is there a way or, or your suggestion for that matter how can we improve collaboration across different stakeholders like what is the one or two things we really need to do you know given india health is a state subject then then you know that uh, then every state is responsible but then there's a national health government and a lot of other issues around there are different ministries which govern including the in some areas is a flood and control department also comes into a, you know covering health systems the water ministry the chemical ministry the health ministry is the other you know, one or two things you suggest and i will request um, of course uh, mr videsh as well for you 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 advise actually in terms of how to improve collaboration for a better future for a better healthcare dr to subhash it, you first and then to, uh, yeah, dr to, to put Videsh. it in very simple terms follow what we have learned in covid we have done that in covid let's not forget you know we are very uh, you know, peculiar system where we are forgetting when the situation improves that is the way we 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 have behaved in the last few you know uh, outbreaks that we have come across made be sars made be plague so let us not forget that collaborative activity that we have been able to implement through the covid private sector all health not only health departments inter departmental you know collaboration but other ministries i can guarantee you even if we retain 50% what of what we are doing as far as covid is concerned i am i am a i am a very hopeful person and i am hoping that even if we retain 50% of the same principles we will be able to achieve that collaboration part and again again let me complete that again i wish to say that do not leave it to the discretion and individual you know choices let it be a part of the system and that part of the system we only when the directives come for example in covid the directives were generated technical directives came from icmr government of india but a lot of things were developed at the state level for example in state of maharashtra we have put the capping as far as the diagnostic part is concerned treatment part is concerned standardization part is concerned for covid why can't we follow the similar pattern after covid for most of the public health problem I mean, we can do that we are doing it so if we are going to forget this lesson i think it will be most unfortunate Vedesh, what will be your advice uh, on how to improve collaboration for better healthcare and better decision making for the future? No, I, I guess uh, Dr. Uh, Sumash Alang has clearly mentioned, right? Uh, there's enough uh, insight that he has got. See, I remember some years back, I was uh, working 
collaborating with World Bank and we are trying to get a data uh, for the country, right? It's a big project that we undertook. But let me tell you, considering healthcare is a state subject, now whether you like it or not, like as I said, Clinical Establishment Act, if you go through it, it's very comprehensive. It actually talks about data collection. It talks about integration and everything, right? So if you ask me anything, one one thing that we may want to do it from here, can we promulgate Clinical Establishment Act as a first? Uh, that itself is going to solve many of your problems. Second, the collaboration, if you look at I don't think deliberately people don't want to collaborate. There, there is no system by which people don't know what is in it for me, what is in it for you, how do I deal with that, right? It happens in my company that I ran. Collaboration is doesn't something come naturally, right? So you, have, you need to set up an environment and a process. Leadership is definitely essential. As I call it, the leadership aspiration process and environment is so important. But the fact of the matter is that if you ask me, first, let's go through setting the system of Clinical Establishment Act. Second is that I think we need to recognize uh, states who are showing a high level of collaboration, bring it to public knowledge. This is, these are all the expected behavior, right? Uh, because if, whether you like it or not, even healthcare system itself, unlike any other system, there are so many players, right? There are someone, seven to eight players who, who create the play, right? Whether it's a payer, provider, policy makers, patient in the middle, physicians out there, laboratories, then you have pharmaceutical industry, diagnostic industry, medical devices, NGOs. There are so many of them, right? So this is not a something easily that we can prescribe that we need to do it, but I think we need to create awareness, right? I think Wonderful. we are not in China, right? China can do it very quickly, but India, we need to enroll and keep doing things like what Maharashtra and few other governments have done and set that up as a standard for others to follow. So I don't think I can give anything beyond that. Wonderful, great too. Before we open up a quick question round, actually, I will ask Dr. Altaf Lal, you know, the, the central of any system, it's also the machines are wonderful, data is great, but we need humans in the middle of healthcare. I'm talking about doctors in the middle of everything. In future, what will be your like a thing for like, how do you see the role changing for doctors as well? That maybe the academics, the way they study MBBS or MD with the new things coming in. Uh, how do you see that shaping actually the role of doctor in the future? You, you, you might no, guess. Uh, two part answer to that. Yeah. I think um, within the Indian medical education system, community medicine has to be prioritized. What I understand at this time, um, individuals who go into community medicine go after they try the internal medicine, um, anesthesiology, et cetera, et cetera. They don't get it. Then they find spots in community medicine. That has to change. I started with um, NCDC when I started the embassy EIS program, a global disease detection program. Those are the individual components that have to come in within the Ministry of Health, within the ICMR networks, so that individuals who are interested in community medicine find a pathway for success. There's a progression for them. There are Subhashiras as the role models. Yes, they can see themselves as leaders. Health systems is a community health systems narrative. Individuals, you and I can be treated by finest doctors, but those finest doctors, you put them responsible for community health, chances are they'll miserably fail. Point number one. In the context of Maharashtra, I know you're winding down this part of the conversation. I would suggest that this, this panel through Subhash Hira, Subhash Lanka, Subhash Hira is a common friend of Subhash and I. Government of Maharashtra starts a bold initiative, zero COVID starts with me. Zero COVID starts with me. Whether that zero is accomplished in six months or two years, but there's a commitment. 
Dr. Oh. Subhash, Dr. Aldaf is giving you a proposal live, actually. Okay. Oh, yes, go ahead, Dr. Aldaf. <laughs> Already, Honorable Chief Minister has made a statement. I mean, what, what <laughs> Dr. Altaf, Mr. Altaf, Dr. Altaf Lal is indicating, the CM has already made a policy. Maja Kutumba, Maji Zababdari, Maja Kutumba, case who they chine. Maja Gawat, case no corona, no COVID in my village, in my family. So that's Wonderful. the policy already in one. That's <laughs> okay. Let them become infectious throughout India. Like I, hope so. I hope so. Right, that's it. May be a st health is a state subject, but state is part of a lot broader fabric, also. Right, what happens in Maharashtra, JNK has to learn, Urusa has to follow, UP has to follow. So, you said in Marathi what I was saying in English zero COVID starts with me. Congratulations. Wonderful. Wonderful. I go to the final thought for in a century again about you know, doctors, you know, how, what kind of manpower you're looking for a future to make sense of all this technology and data. It will certainly change a lot of things how medicine is practiced. How, what, quickly, briefly, how do you see that the relationship of man and machine changing in the future of healthcare? So we just, we have a live example of this. We spent three years in a tribal district of Madhya Pradesh, Mandla. Right. The goal was to eliminate malaria. We eliminated indigenous transmission of malaria in under three years. A staff of 200 and plus people were doing the work of about 1200 people. Normally, if, if you would take into account how state would function. Right. Data was captured at the time data was collected. It was centralized. Through that data, supply chain of commodities was directed. Right. We knew exactly where person A is on a given day. Right. We know where his supervisor was at that time. We right. know the supervisor supervisor was at that time. So I, I think it exists. Sanjeev will tell you it exists. The key is but for- Sanjeev, how do, you, how do you see briefly, how do you see the role of machine and man, the doctors and the machines? How do you see that happening in the future, next five, 10 years? And you, your microphone, Sanjeev, sorry. Yeah, sorry, your, your microphone, Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev, your microphone is uh, off, yeah, sorry. So the doctors have to learn the technology a lot more than they use today. For example, the augmented reality, you could be remote somewhere and through 5G network, you probably might be even able to perform a surgery. I mean, there are case studies that Google has showed and it's, it's possible. So augmented reality, interpreting the data correctly, getting used to the robotics automation, tele uh, medication, um, you know, video consulting, I think all of these have to become a norm. When COVID started, most of the IT companies went from work from office to work from home, just like that. India is very well digitalized. There were a lot of countries across the world were very, very surprised that there was zero disruption when the COVID hit India in terms of IT services. It means Indian digitization is happening. There are internet that work faster in smaller towns compared to even metros. There are a lot of good companies have come in play from that perspective, using the technology, not just as an option, but it has to become the mainstream because when you use the technology, when you adopt the technology, the scalability, the reach that we are talking about becomes very, very easy. But Without I, I, the, I, yes, 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 sorry, you know, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I think from that perspective, I see a lot more interaction that needs to happen between the doctor and the and the medicine and the, the, uh, the technology, and then obviously, you know, as the, the telemedicine centers that needs to be established, you know, maybe our, most of the primary cares need to be retrofitted to adopt a lot of these new technologies. I think if you do that, I think then, you know, we will be able to one, get the reach and second, the scale. Wonderful. We're almost on time. We have a couple of questions and Sarbhi can help me to read quickly then and I request you to make brief comments. Yes, Sarbhi. Thank you so much, everyone. I think it's so motivating. We have a lot of questions for our panelists here. <laughs> but I think uh, we will take if there are any repetitions, we will avoid them. But to begin with, uh, our first question uh, is, is the delivery of public health programs going to change post COVID-19? Do we now need to deliver Asha Anganwadi services at home, at doorsteps? Dr. Subhash, yes. I, I think um, you know, there will be changes. Definitely there will be changes. Uh, I'll give you an example. 
my our honorable health minister's hometown is Jalna. I went with him to Jalna Civil Hospital and we were so worried because 35, 40 cases in ICU and two MD medicine fellows, no intensivist. He was, he was agitated and so all of us, what do we do? Today, there are two more additions given, but they are being guided by the task force members who are great clinicians in Mumbai and Pune and on literally every day, specified time, case management of each and every critical case, he is being guided by the people sitting in Mumbai, in Jaslok, in, uh, in Pune and Things are much better in Jalna, what they were uh, six, eight months back. So this is a concrete case, what is happening in the field as such. Now coming to the actual delivery of the ASHA and Anganwadi services, I don't think there is going to be totally at the doorstep level. Because let us appreciate, it will be two way. For example, there will be some, some delivery, uh, some healthcare delivery provisions which can be done at the domestic level as per the needs. But basically, the number is going to be restricted. The population is going to expand. Look at the infrastructural right. development in the country. We are right. working with the 2001 or 2011 population when we are in 2021. So human resources is going to be a challenge. And accordingly, we'll have to do a combination of the two right up to the peripheral level. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the second question quickly. I will come Thank to you there. so much. Um, so this is about data again. So it says, uh, uh, thanks for highlighting the value of data. Is there standards or mandates policy at state or national level in reporting to centralized repository? How far this could be enforced in public and private sectors? Dr. Altafla, you want to take that? Your microphone, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, just brief comment. I will just add one more questions then. Yeah, yeah I, I may not be the right person because I don't follow in depth the systems in India. So perhaps Jeev could. Sanjeev, so maybe perhaps uh, you take that one. I think from the IT perspective, I can definitely talk. There are standard APIs uh, that are available that can potentially plug into every healthcare uh, systems and ERP systems that could then potentially be connected to a standard analytic software. Right, so that's it's the system wise, the day, the, the technology and the ERP softwares are available. I think now with the government standards, the policy guidelines, um, are there in place for the hospitals to report upwards? I think I'm not qualified to comment on that. Uh, Vinesh, you want to chip in and uh, share a thought? Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's it's not as easy as uh, it's you know. I, I don't think I I'll be competent to respond on that because it's a very complex subject, and he has made a very important point. So. Okay, wonderful. So we go ahead to the third one. All right. So there are a lot of questions on actually telemedicines. We'll, yeah, we we'll take two only, Survi. Now we are just. Okay. Um, we, so let's yeah. let's take telemedicines, and this will cover for possibly four five questions. You know, covering that. So um, this says there have been a lot of talks about telemedicine. What potential do you see in telemedicine for India in the future? Okay, any one of you, you go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, I, I think it, there is a great potential in one word. There is a great potential. I can assure you, for example, let's take a concrete case. In third way, we are anticipating that there will be more pediatric or younger age group cases. That's what the contemplation is. And accordingly, we are preparing. Now, there is a one school, there is a task force separately working on. There is one school of thought which says that, you know, we have a, a highly trained pediatrician right from the community health center level, which is out of question. There won't be so many. My suggestion in the last meeting with the Honorable Chief Minister and the Chief Minister was very simple. I said, sir, we are private pediatricians, we are government pediatricians, they are located in the uh, urban areas, which are at the district and sub district, not below that particular level. So let us have a centers which are much better to take critical care of pediatric cases and it will be referred from the most peripheral level through the appropriate ambulances rather than trying to look for highly trained neonatologists, pediatricians to be located at the sub-center. We are not going to achieve that because it is nobody is going to stay there if I am a neonatologist. So uh, the, the idea is 
prepare the centers who are going to deliver critical care at the peripheral level. But these guys will be able to guide the doctors in the primary health centers, in the community health centers, how to refer, how to manage primarily through the telemedicine. So telemedicine is or telemedicine's versions. I, telemedicine could be just a very basic one. There are going to be further versions which is going to be essential. And I think without technology, without data, if any health services of any state is going to be implemented, that will be a most retrograde state. Every health minister and health minister of this India now who has taken over recently yesterday, my appeal to him and request to him going to be, please, you have great challenge. And one of the challenges, you are not going to be able to achieve that HR in short period, but you will be able to achieve the use of technology so as to equip the capacity of the people who are already there. You know, that, 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 that's so wonderfully put. I think uh, if, I, if I request all of you in a one word or one brief sentence, what is the one thing you want to recommend to the, uh, to the health minister in Maharashtra or to the other, other ministers across the country? What should be the one thing they should put a topmost priority in the next five, six months, particularly dealing with the COVID-19? Aldaf, I can go ahead with you and then I will come to the Videsh after that. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's a very valid and appropriate question. I'll have a recommendation for the health minister, for the union health minister, and a recommendation and an ask for the health minister of the government of Maharashtra. Government of Maharashtra first, focus, focus, focus. And since health is a state subject, the responsibility is at state level, but certain structures at national level devise strategies, devise policies. My recommendation would be create systems that you feed in real time. Like Subhash mentioned, what is, what is that state of Maharashtra would like to see? For instance, emergency use authorization. I'm let's let's brief, the, yeah, very brief. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> emergency yeah. from Maharashtra to Delhi. Emergency use authorization has worked phenomenally in India and elsewhere. Why can't we use versions of EUA for other medicines that need to go but, through the whole system? But they should let me come to you. What do you... Now, last last yes. piece. Yes. The Drug Control General of India is a phenomenal institution. Elevate that to a government of India secretary level position, very similar to DBT, ICMR, and CSIR. If you do that, the processes, functionalities will improve significantly. Health of India will improve significantly. Wonderful. Vidish, what do you think should be the topmost priority for our ministers in the next five, six months, given the COVID is still out there? So I think a uh, very simple suggestion I have. Uh, as you know, pneumococcal vaccine is currently in the schedule of pediatric patients. It's part of the Indian government for rotavirus as well as a pneumococcal vaccine. Let's accelerate this for pediatric patients. Already there, stocks are available. Children need to get vaccinated, number one. Second, now it's approved for people above 18 plus. I saw the approval from Director uh, DCGI, and it obviously the approval is for 60 plus. Frankly, in my opinion, based on all the data that we are seeing, please start looking at PCV, pneumococcal vaccine, as an auxiliary vaccine, which can prevent a serious uh, you know, impact on whenever a COVID hits. At the end of the day, it's all about pneumonia, it's all about lungs, so for me, the one suggestion if I'll give, the government should seriously consider that accelerating beyond pediatrics and go to the adults. Wonderful. Mr. Sanjeev, what do you think is the one re recommendation from your side? I think we need to achieve patient care anywhere, anytime. That's possible only through technology adoption and harnessing the data. So I think that should be the focus for the health ministers, both at Maharashtra as well as central level. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Subhash, you know, we were really keen to have a minister here and he was very keen to come over for this summit. He couldn't make it. We could completely understand that. What are you going to tell him after this dialogue here when you meet him next? Sure. I will certainly put everything what has been discussed in a nutshell and clearly indicate to him that there are avenues available for Maharashtra. 
there are private sectors including companies like you are available for us to you know take the strength of the data analysis everything related to data and use this to improve the quality of whatever the data that is being collected in the state and two it is not only collection compilation and analysis but its implementation and feedback that entire circle if it is established right at the block level like i used to say that every multi purpose worker must know why i am collecting this information data how am i going to make use of it if we can really achieve thank you so that, much that's so wonderful thank you so much i think uh, well uh, this is it and thank you so much uh, you know uh, dr subhash dr daf lal videsh and sanjeev for joining us it was really insightful conversation we uh, we have a lot of people who joined us on social media platforms as well we are going to share this video with all of our you know viewers and uh, you know readers and we really look forward to keep this conversation going we will be having you know same discussion with other thought leaders in different parts of the country and we're certainly looking forward for a better better solutions uh, better interventions and that will only happen when we keep talking when we keep collaborating so on behalf of my whole team here thank you so much for joining and i request to be uh, that it's over to you again thanks a lot thank you so much everyone uh, with that we will move on to our next session for the day and for that i would invite uh, uh, my colleague jisha krishnan who's the editor of first check which is a flagship project of data leads in health analytics asia uh, to moderate the next session uh, uh, for today uh, over to you jisha with that thank you hello i'm jisha krishnan editor of first check first check is health analytics asia's flagship award winning fact checking initiative that endeavors to fight medical misinformation as a health journalist for over 17 years now i am acutely aware of the yawning gaps and many challenges that india's healthcare system has been burdened with and this was much before the covid-19 pandemic toppled healthcare systems across the globe like dominoes you cannot solve a problem on the same level that it was created albert einstein had said you need to rise above today for the maiden summit of the health of india series it gives me immense pleasure to introduce you all to five such health trade blazers who rose above found innovative solutions to address the many challenges that india's healthcare system is facing though each of them come from diverse backgrounds and have unique stories to share they all have certain qualities in common the courage to challenge the status quo the ability to take calculated risks the zest to explore new avenues and set the stage for the future of india's health without taking any more of your time let me introduce you to the first speaker for today's flash talk session dr geeta manjunar the founder and ceo of niramai healthcare health analytics the company has developed a breakthrough machine learning solution for detecting early stage breast cancer in a non invasive radiation free manner she has 16 us patents to her credit and more pending grant ladies and gentlemen please join me in welcoming dr geeta manjuna hi i'm geeta ceo and founder of niramai health analytics where we are developing a new method of detecting breast cancer using machine learning on thermal images machine learning is a, a part of artificial intelligence where database decision making can be done using mathematical models uh, probability theory statistics and like simply speaking it is computer making decisions just like human beings so it can be trained to learn about certain decisions that humans do well and then using huge compute power and intelligent algorithms it can actually sort of start mimicking some of the decisions that humans may do and particularly in healthcare this is very very important because there's huge amounts of data in healthcare it could be medical images like our chest x rays or or uh, you know ultrasound data or just uh, you know the Uh, temperature data that's coming in or in an icu there is like uh, you know monitoring kits around so all of the data can that be used to make better health possible
for the end user. That's where machine learning can make a huge difference. And this, when coupled with intelligent devices that are coming in, different type of sensors that are uh, being released uh, in the world today can be a huge boon to our rural healthcare. I believe that in India, just like uh, digital divide, there is a healthcare divide, right? You know, we all know that number of doctors uh, compared to the number of patients that are needed is hugely sort of, you know, there's a disparity, very few doctors and a large number of patients in India. Particularly in villages, one doctor is serving thousands of families. So in this case, if a machine learning based healthcare bot can make some decisions, quick decisions to enable people to get quality healthcare at the right time, it is the best thing that can happen. We have seen how COVID has affected rural healthcare and taken away so many lives just because they could not reach a hospital on time. And this can be elevated using machine learning because simple triaging decisions of who needs the care immediately can be made with automated decision-making. The same machine learning model in a city, for example, can also be helpful to the doctors. Each doctor, for example, each radiologist is serving lakhs of patients. So it's huge load of workload of patients that the doctor has to bear. And here, once again, the tool can come in, help prioritize patients who need quick attention for the next uh, set of tests or treatment, or even things like, you know, by mistake, if a doctor misses a cancer in a chest X-ray or cancer in breast, the tool can sort of do a thorough check and say, maybe you missed it. Why don't you check it, right? Can be a second reader, just a helping tool for the doctor as well. It can also analyze a lot of data and within minutes provide the summary that the doctor can review and make decisions much faster. So it can be a friend to the doctor and an extended arm uh, to the doctor in rural areas. So I believe machine learning in healthcare has a huge potential to bridge the gap between rural healthcare as well as the urban facility that we have and enable quality healthcare affordable and accessible way to everyone in India per se. Particularly talking about Niramai, at Niramai, we have developed a new method of detecting breast cancer using machine learning. So we just measure temperature variations on the chest and we have developed an AI-based analysis which automatically can analyze these temperature variations and say if the person has breast cancer. If so, where is it likely to be? Or is it just an abnormality or what is the probability that the tool thinks that it is cancer itself? And all this can be done within 15 minutes and can be done by a health worker. In a village, it automatically generates a triage report, a red, yellow, green traffic light output. A red means bring her to the hospital. Green means she can just wait for the next screening, she's fine, right? And the same thing can also be used as a diagnostic tool in a hospital where we generate a complete report automatically and provide additional information, quantitative scoring that will help the doctor decide what kind of next action needs to be taken. And this is very unique because it's completely radiation free. We do not use x-rays. We just measure temperature, absolutely safe. It does work on women of all age groups, 18 to 18 years. And it's completely uh, affordable, much, much more affordable than the existing methods. One tenth, one twentieth, the cost of existing methods can be done by simple health workers, saves a lot of time for the doctor as well. And most importantly, it is completely privacy aware. Nobody sees or touches the person during the test. No see, no touch, no pain, no radiation. We hope solutions such as these can enable so many diseases which are getting detected late and we're losing so many people for diseases such as cancer, which only when detected early would have high efficacy. So in future, I actually see how machine learning can aid a doctor, bridge the gap between rural and urban healthcare and enable affordable, accessible healthcare for everyone. And enable early detection of diseases such as cancer, 
you know, health diseases and so many non-communicable diseases and then save many, many lives. Thank you, Dr. Geeta, for that insightful talk. Indeed, if more people looked at technology as an ally rather than a foe, then the future of Indian healthcare will certainly be brighter. At Health Analytics Asia, we believe in the power of research to help better navigate these uncertain times as well as shape the future of the healthcare narrative. As one of the oldest medical research institutions in the world, the Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, plays a key role in addressing the challenges and finding innovative solutions to India's many healthcare problems. I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Rajnikant Srivastava, Head of Department of Research Management, Policy Planning and Communication in Delhi, and Director of Research Medical Research Regional Medical Adhyapadu, Regional Medical Research Center Gorakhpur as our next speaker for the session. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Actually, you are asking uh, me about the ICMA role in building India's medical research capacity. So I would like to emphasize that ICMA is one of the oldest research organization in the country. It was set up in the year 1911 before Delhi became the capital of India. ICMA was set up with the name Indian Research Fund Association. And now ICMR is the apex body in the country for the planning, promotion, coordination and implementation of health research under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So now we have completed more than 110 years. So we are working since last 110 years. And our health research priorities are aligned with the national priorities and the need of the country. ICMR is having a network of 27 research institutes across the country. They are working in different disease specific areas. For example, we have institute in the malaria research, we have institute in the tuberculosis research, we have institute in the leprosy, HIV AIDS, nutrition, occupational health. So we have a network of 20, 27 institutes and we are working together and how we can address the health issues of the country. As you have mentioned that uh, COVID-19 has been a serious problem and since two years back, we never knew about the COVID-19. And ICMR has played a critical role, important role, so far as the COVID-19 is concerned. And before COVID, you might be aware there was a problem of DIPA, Jika, Dengue, Chikungunya. And ICMR was instrumental in tackling the outbreak and epidemics, whether it was the Nipa outbreak, whether it was a Jika outbreak. And during the H1N1, that helped in creating a network of laboratories across the country. And we were able to set up a BSL-4 laboratory in Pune. And because of these existing laboratories, we were able to, to do research when the COVID struck India. And during last one and a half year, in, if you go back last year in 2020, January 2020, there was only single laboratory that was National Institute of Biology Pune, NIV Pune. And that was a single laboratory. They were able to do testing for the COVID-19. And today, as of now, I am talking today on 5th of July, 2021, we have a network of around 2,700 laboratories across the country. So, so far as the testing is concerned for the COVID-19, that is not a big issue for the COVID-19. Besides the COVID-19 testing, ICMR has also played a critical role in the development of the COVID diagnostics, such as covid coverage ELISA. ICMR was was also instrumental in isolating the virus, characterizing it, and having a partnership with the Bharat Biotech. And that was fruitful in developing the vaccine, that is a co-vaccine, the first indigenous vaccine, and that has been rolled out in January 2019. So that is all about the ICMR. Beside the COVID, COVID vaccine and the COVID diagnostics, ICMR was also doing the validation of the kits and the reagents, for example, RT-PCR, ICMR, validated, evaluated around 360 RT-PCR kit, then antigen 114, then home test 3, and rapid, rapid antibody test 209, RNA extraction 275, VTM 259, and ELISA 107. So ICMR was supporting the private partners and the industries so that all these uh, regions, kits, and the diagnostics, they should be available in the country. That is how the role of ICMR was very important so far as the COVID-19 is concerned. Besides this testing, ICMR was also crucial in doing the zero survey. 
for example, in, the, in June last year, ICMR did the first zero survey. And at that time, the, the prevalence was only 0.7%. Then ICMR did the second zero survey in the month of August and September. The, at that time, the zero prevalence was around uh, 7%. Then ICMR did the third zero survey that happened in the month of December and January. At that time, the zero prevalence was around 21%. And ICMR clearly indicated that currently even 79% of the people, they are still susceptible and they can get exposure to the COVID-19. And that resulted in the second peak of the COVID-19 because the 79% of the population, they were totally susceptible, only 21% having the zero prevalence. And now recently ICMR has initiated the four zero survey it is in the process and very soon we will be able to publish the results of the four zero survey that is happening around 20 that is happening in around 70 districts of the 21 states that will be completed in july and results will be available soon so besides this covid 19 because since last one and a half year icmr was on the forefront in dealing with the covid 19 and providing the support to the government of india to combat and to tackle the COVID-19. But besides the COVID-19, ICMR has also playing important role in various other health research areas. For example, the, we are now targeting the NTV by 2025. ICMR has recently set up in, in India National Tuberculosis Consortium, that is ITRC. And uh, we have started the National TB Prevalence Survey across the country after 60 years. That will give you a burden of tuberculosis in the country and that will help how we can eliminate TB by 2025. Similarly, ICMR has also launched a program that is a Mera India, Malaria Elimination Research Alliance, because the target of malaria elimination is 2030. So that is a platform where the many stakeholders, national, international, private partners, NGOs, they can sit together and they can discuss about the future programs and plans, how we can fast track the malaria elimination. ICMR is also working on the lymphatic filariasis in the Kala Ajar and non-communicable disease because while we are talking about the communicable disease, the non-communicable disease like the hypertension is a serious problem. Cardiovascular disease is again a serious problem. Cancers are rising regularly. So ICMR is having a national cancer registry program that is also running and providing the burden of cancer across the country. Recently, we have initiated an India Hypertension Management Initiative, IHMI. So we are doing a survey across the country that will let us know how much is the burden of hypertension in the country. So that kind of research is ICMR doing. We are having a robust capacity building program. We are having a GRF, SRF, STS, postdoctors. So young generation, they can also get, get exposure to the health research and they can pursue their career in the area of health research. So we have having a robust program in the capacity building and human resource development. So that is how ICMR is working. And regularly, many other research programs, they are being translated for the inclusion in the government policy. And we are always aligned. Many of the ICMR Institute, we are having a regional, regional institute, regional medical research center working in the Port Blair, Anuman and Nicobar, in Bhuvaneshwar, in Gorakhpur. For example, in Gorakhpur, we are working to tackle the JE and AES. That was a serious problem. In Anuman and Nicobar, leptospirosis was a serious problem. So, our institute in Anuman and Nicoba, they are doing good quality research in the area of leptospirosis. Similarly, we have an institute in Dibrugar, Regional Medical Research Center in Dibrugar. So they are working on the regional health issues, for example, paragonomiasis is the problem in the Dibrugar area. So they are focusing on the problems of the northeastern area, for example, paragonomiasis, malaria, tribal health issues. So ICMR institutes, so they are working as per the requirement, as per the need of that region. For example, in Desert Medicine Research Center, that is now renamed as the Center for the Non-Communicable Disease Implementation Research, they are working in the area of local health issues. So many of the ICMR Institute, either they are working for the national health cause or for the regional health issues. That is how the overall ICMR works. Thank you, Dr. Rajnikan, for reiterating the significance of investing in health research and learning from past epidemics in order to emerge stronger from the current scenario. Healthcare, like all other industries, needs to brace itself for the next normal. Apart from cutting-edge technology and sound research, what else will it take for healthcare in India to reimagine the future? To answer that question, we have a renowned public policy and health systems expert as our next speaker, Dr. Chandrakant Laharia, 
Welcome to Health of India eSubmit series. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I think in today's time, health equity is very important consideration. We need to remember that uh, when we talk about health equity, it is about absence of uh, any unfair, avoidable or preventable difference in health among the population groups. We always know that in health inequities have always been there. Kings and the royalty always had a higher and better health outcomes, lived longer than the commoners. But then the time had changed. Now we need to have a equal health conditions for everyone. We know even 100 years ago or 200 years ago, the pandemic of cholera and great influenza of 1918-1920, the poorer and the people who were on lower on the social hierarchy died at higher rate, they were more infected. But in 2021, we expect a little better that the health outcomes of individuals should not be dependent upon their socioeconomic status or any other equity stratifier. Way back in 1971, Julian Tudor Hart gave a very important concept, the inverse care law. He said that uh, the availability of health services inversely proportionate to the needs of the people, which essentially means the poorer, lower in the social hierarchy have a less access to healthcare than the richer, rich who had a better access to health services. So in today's time, we always need to focus and we should focus upon health inequity. What are the commonly linked determinants of health equity? Often the place of residence, the rural, urban, tribal, or any other uh, setup determines the level of health of citizen. Race and ethnicity is also important consideration. Occupation of people, workers, or employed or unemployed, the gender, uh, male, female, transgender, all of those decide the health outcomes. Religion. The education, the poorly educated or higher educated have better access, the socioeconomic status, social capital and resources, there are many stratifiers which determines the health status of population, which they should not. Thankfully, the global community has started talking about universal health coverage, which essentially say that all individual and communities, irrespective of where they are living, what they do, should have access to quality healthcare services without financial help, uh, uh, hardship. So essentially the global target of universal health coverage is focused upon achieving equity that no one should be left behind. Everybody should have equal access to healthcare services, all population, all services, and for everyone it should be affordable. We need to remember that uh, uh, when we are designing healthcare services, the focus has to be on most marginalized. We need to think of, uh, let's say a vegetable vendor in an urban setup, whether he has a similar access to healthcare services as somebody who is working class. And uh, we need to think of a tribal uh, population or tribal family, whether they have similar access as any other uh, living in the same state in an urban setup. We need to think of underserved migrant person in an urban slum, whether he had that kind of access or not. So one of the way to ensure that health inequalities are or health inequities are addressed that we need to have a granular, good quality data. Now, for health equity, the data can come from national surveys or administrative reporting, official reporting surveys, and special surveys can be conducted. But key thing, if we want to achieve health equity, is that we have a granular data on the determinants which we discuss and with things which we think that could be uh, cause of inequity. Now, coming to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we know that uh, there are so much of uh, impact on the poor, vulnerable, marginalized in this pandemic that Oxford has, Ox, um, Oxfam, the Oxfam uh, International has called this virus as a, the inequality virus because it has inequally affected the marginalized downtrodden. We are seeing an ongoing and live example of inequity in the vaccine availability and distribution. The rich have a better access to vaccine then the not so rich, the urban setups have a better access due to more, uh, more availability or higher number of centers and private facilities than, uh, than people living in rural area. So uh, inequities are pervading all across and they become really big challenge and they are all everywhere. COVID has reminded us that uh, COVID-19 pandemic that there is access to health services, access to vaccines between the countries and within countries are really big challenge. 
So possible solution of tackling all these inequities is that we recognize and need uh, and recognize the need for and strengthen health equity monitoring. And to do that, we need to collect the timely data. We also need to look at the data from various stratified, rural, urban, male, female, uh, poor, rich, uh, working class, not working class, slum dwellers or uh, uh, middle class family. So equity stratified data in multiple layers collected in a timely manner through the surveys, through administrative reporting or every possible mechanism. And then analyzed by experts in the timely manner to inform policy making. That's how we can achieve equity. Uh, I think world has learned a lot in last uh, few decades. We need to put that knowledge into practice. And if the start can be uh, with many of the ongoing intervention in COVID-19 and the world should focus upon the, uh, the, uh, the uh, e equity, in, especially in the vaccine uh, delivery and availability. And I think that will be a great start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chandraka. That was truly thought-provoking. Just like your brilliant book, Till We Win, India's Fight Against the COVID-19 Pandemic. Before we move any further, uh, we want to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Naresh Trehan. Dr. Trehan was uh, actually, he was a, a part of the panel in the beginning, but because of a hard-pressed commitment, uh, he could not join us on the panel. But that is really, really nice of you, Dr. Trehan, to have uh, joining us for this special series today uh, and to share your thoughts. Uh, thank you so much once again. With that, it's over to oh, you. Sorry, first, first, my apologies. I had to be I called in by the health minister, the new health minister. So... There was no choice in, for me from that. Of course, we so understand. I, I appreciate the invitation to speak here. And I did have the opportunity of listening to the last part of uh, Chandra Kanti's uh, delivery. Of course, he's, he's a very learned man. And I don't think that anybody on this panel or anybody in their right mind would disagree that there should be equitable health care available to everybody. There, is, there are many, many things written and we've been struggling with it. And if you if just as a reminder, there is no country in the world which has been able to master this animal. And least of all, India, where the population is totally out of control. So if, uh, if we can really come up with a working model, I'm, I'm on the ground. So I'm a surgeon. I, I, I see, face all this. And I'm also on the task force for uh, uh, the Supreme Court on the National Task Force. So I got some insight into the thinking and the challenges and, and things like that. So obviously it's a very daunting task. If you take countries like America who can't deliver after spending $15 trillion on, on healthcare and still not getting anywhere near where we should be, or you take the UK where NHS is, is a good service, but very wanting in, in many, many things. So this has been a very difficult, uh, sort of uh, intellectually a very important factor, but a very difficult to surmount this, uh, this whole problem. So any, what I'm trying to say is that rather than, than giving a demand side from us, we should look at the delivery side of it. How can we accomplish it? If we have, if we have granular data is, is very important, but we go down to granular solutions also. So just if the problem is that not all of us are actually working together to say, yes, we have a challenge on our hands. How can we actually overcome it? Now, money is one problem because everything that you do costs money. That's not a, a, is a, is a country like India where we all, we've always said that not enough is being uh, given for healthcare. But the government seems to be responding now to say yes, and pandemic has actually brought it very close to the nose that we have a problem and we better take care of it. But there are multiple factors to it. Multiple factors be environmental. I mean, if you if you hear the delivery of uh, uh, the, the New York Times writer Tom Friedman, who wrote Earth is Flat, uh, he said he said this is a war. This is a war between Mother Nature and father greed, that the human greed has destroyed everything around us. How much of anything is enough? How much do we want to? So unless we, as a, as a 
population of the world start respecting the earth. That is one part which will otherwise this opportunistic, uh, uh, so uh, a kind of infective uh, organisms, whether it is virus or bacteria or fungus or whatever, they will always be there. They they are part of the ecosystem. We have we have disturbed it. We have we have ripped it apart. So these are this is just the beginning. And if we don't correct course today, then they will be held to pay 10, 20 years from now. So I think that if we can, we, it, it's very interesting that we have panel after panel where we have talking heads, including me, which doesn't go anywhere. So my frustration is with life is that, okay, we spend a lot of time talking about it. I have some little knowledge because I'm a surgeon. There are many, many uh, doyens of knowledge on this panel. But we need to also go beyond that. You say, if we say something, you commit yourself to it. If you're saying it on a panel to say this should happen, that should happen, just do it. Don't say this should happen. We all know what should happen. So I'm saying that in future, uh, Sayyidji, when you, when you put together panels, they say that after in the half an hour afterwards, there'll be a working solution part of the panel. So you say, okay, what, are you signing up? If I said something, I should be signing up for it. I shouldn't be done say, oh yeah, I gave some, uh, some lofty uh, uh, proposal to everybody and then uh, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable, what do I care? That's not how it should be. That means that if we believe, we should get on the ground and start doing it. So right now, like one of the things is controlling the cost of healthcare. Then, and, and as a first thing, we need to establish what is the cost of delivery of one unit of healthcare. So you unitize the whole thing. Once we know that a, a nationally or internationally accepted norms of how to establish the unit price. You, you, so, so there are many people who put many things out of the hat and there are different interests. So we need to converge them into a realistic costing. Once we have the realistic costing, then we should say, okay, this is what is allowed. Like today, I, we demanded, I'm one of the first uh, uh, one to demand that do not allow private sector to charge what they want for delivery of vaccine. And in the first uh, few weeks, we saw lots of people taking lots of uh, profit, which was not required. And the, the government responded to our, to our demand to say, please fix the price so that nobody, it should be, it should be universal. It should not be opaque. It should be transparent. So that was done. So we know now, everybody knows that you're not going to make any money. If anything, you're going to lose some money on, on vaccination. And the other thing I, I would like to inform Chandra Kanji is that I don't think that there is inequity in distribution of, of, uh, of the uh, vaccine. Because we, we are on the ground. We are, we are all, everybody. So I see. But the problem is that on the ground, there's a lot of hesitancy. There is much more hesitancy in the rural area than in the urban areas. And right now, we are experiencing that we are, when we are going to villages, we are all participating in that that there is vaccine that we carry as a, as a, as a registration dose, 30, 40% don't turn up after registering. And this is, a, this is everybody's experience. So I think if we can actually do everything we can to dispel fears of vaccine, that will be a service today. That will be the service to say, we do not have, the data is very clear, we do not have any major adverse effects. We do not have any side effects with this whole thing of bugaboo of, of clotting and all that. I mean, even if you believe it, there's nothing to believe because there's a it's four per million. Uh, and that is a normal stroke rate anyway. Or even uh, it's, it's lower actually than what normal is. And we can always say, okay, everybody take aspirin for the next three weeks. Small baby aspirin. So there are solutions. Uh, sorry if I'm going away from your... No, no, spirit. absolutely. I think these are these are wonderful thoughts. I think this was almost the discussion we had early in the plenary. I think all of them eventually agreed that, you know, we need to start from somewhere. We can't just hope the future will be there. We need to create it. We need to work together I, at different levels. So you can count me in in that. <laughs> I think I think you you really underlined, underlined that, you know, fact. Any productive, 
any productive activity, I'm a volunteer. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much for joining. And really, I appreciate that you came back and again shared your thoughts. Because what we, you know, that's we've been almost in a concluding phase. Is it's really important for us to be honest to have the best minds together. And you know what happens that often we are having a lot of bad situation because best best men or women decide to take a back seat. They allow others to come forward in a lot of discussions and policy interventions. But I think it's also very important for our policymakers eventually to take these thoughts together. And we discussed with Dr. Subhash, who's joining, he's an advisor to the Maharashtra Chief Minister. He was in the panel and we requested him at the end of the panel, can he take this discussion directly to the minister when he's meeting him in the afternoon and whether these recommendations will find some place on actually on the ground. So, so I, I, would, I would request you then, Dr. Trihan as well, what will be your, I know you're, you're, you're there, you, you're in, you have an insight what's happening at the national level, but particularly with Maharashtra, you know, they, they were really badly hit in the second wave as well. What will be your recommendation like a, for a state like Mumbai, for a state like Maharashtra in the next five, seven, eight months, how they need to be more careful so that we, we are better dealing with the, you know, future, image by, future. By the way, having taken a sort of a deeper peek into Maharashtra's handling of the COVID, the, this whole onslaught that came, and the systems they have put in place, and we have one of the uh, two people from Maharashtra who are part of the NTF. So we exchange information. I've heard the models and all that. I don't think you can teach much to Maharashtra. Maharashtra has done extremely well. And the only thing is that we all know what the universal fact is. It, there are three factors which shall actually decide when and how high the third wave is going to be. So, one, of course, is what we are talking about is, is public behavior and decreasing vaccine hesitancy. If we can all, whoever has any say anywhere, even if it's your own employees in your household or whatever, we should be always on the, uh, one words coming out of mouth is that vaccine is safe and it is essential to protect yourself, your family and the country. So if somebody can understand that, that is one. Two, very soon there will be enough vaccine available and we have the capacity. And I'll give you a data. So this, there, is a, there is a modulation done by somebody very knowledgeable called Shakti. Shakti has got that if we can vaccinate starting July, 50 lakh people a day, we, we can flatten the wave or reduce the wave by 25 plus percent. If we can vaccinate 70 lakhs plus people a year, uh, a day, sorry, we will be able to reduce the wave by more than 50 <coughs> percent. Excuse me. And if we can go to 90 lakhs, we will flatten the wave. So, and, and it is, it stands to logic, except that you don't know what the virus is going to do. That's the unknown. That is it going to come up with another variant which will which will cause more devastation in this world? We don't know that. So this is a war. But in this in this war, the first thing we know is that no matter what variant is around, it, vaccines do give great protection. So that is one. Two. <coughs> the third is government's determination to not let it spread. So firm action, quick action. Wherever you see a fire contain it, no matter what you have to do, because that will be temporary. If we, if we can stop a wave by locking down the whole country by, in two months, doesn't matter. It will be much less lost than if it goes on for six, eight months and devastates so many people. <clears throat> so it's only the administration that can be sensitized that real time information is coming and you know where the hotspots are you know, today, i give you an example. The entire airspace of the world, not India, of the whole world is managed from one center in Oslo. Every plane that is in the sky, and there are lakhs and lakhs of them in the sky, they are being mapped by this sophisticated IT uh, system, which tells them exactly who, where, if they're coming too near each other, is there a collision cause? What is there? Are they maintaining the right uh, elevation? All that stuff. 
So if we can reach that stage, and it didn't happen today, it's been happening for many years. Of course, it's being so, um, uh, improved every day. But we can have, and this is what we have recommended to the from to, from the Supreme Court Committee to the government that you must have a COVID war room which brings in information real time, so that you can guide the state governments, the district authorities, the block level people. That look, that's the hot spot right there. And please contain it. There is a very interesting uh, example of Bhilwada district in Rajasthan. That one DC of the area decided that we this, there are too many cases here. I will fight it myself. He actually encircled the whole whole block and locked down the district. COVID has not seen more than. 5, 10, 15, 20 cases a day, ever. Because of the fact that this was one decisive person who did this, this, this uh, maneuver. So as a country, if we do it, yes, we can go back to real life, hopefully by January. I think, uh, thank you so much for these wonderful thoughts. I know I, I eventually take your point on data and that also makes me really glad, actually, we're launching a data hub today at the end of the summit today. But Dr. Triha, we will keep this conversation going and we're having the next round in Delhi and we look forward to have you again for your you know, insightful you know, the discussion and advice on moving forward in India with the future of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. That was so really nice, Dr. Trihan, to have joined us. Uh, I know it's really, really hard pressing for him and like you said that the uh, that the minister had called an uh, urgent meeting in the morning uh, but we really appreciate that he took out time uh, so moving back to our uh, uh, our speakers of the flash talk session i think we will go back to the next that. yeah the yes. next speakers or viewers i think anucha our colleague anucha yes right? yeah and anucha has a lot to say about it so let's go back uh, to what our speaker has to say as we look to recover from this pandemic it's important to seize every opportunity for innovation and growth. Our next speaker, Mr. Suyog Joshi, the Chief Product Officer at Nibi, an industrial analytics company, will shed light on the role of technology in providing actionable insights to help businesses plan for the future. Welcome to the Health of India eSummit series, Mr. Suyog. Hello everyone. All of us are going through the pandemic which, is, which has not happened in centuries. Everything is shaken, which is of our life, be it you know, our day-to-day -day commute, day-to-day -day lives, eating habits, etc. And the most important thing which has come to limelight in this whole scenario is healthcare sector. The importance of healthcare sector, even though it was always acknowledged, but the kind of prominence it has got in this particular pandemic is unparalleled. And as they say, few things change for forever and for good. So I guess now this is going to be the time when things are going to change for, 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 our, uh, for the whole world as far as the healthcare sector is concerned. Now coming back, com coming to healthcare, what what are we talking about? Are we, we are talking about changes in the infrastructure? The very important change which we are going to see uh, in next few days is the focus on the APIs, basically creation of APIs within India with Atmanirbhar Bharat taking up front stage, basically the API formulation in India is going to increase. We are talking about the key ingredients which are needed for vaccines. Lot of things are actually going to happen in the days to come. Now, a lot of people keep on talking about the economic stimulus, uh, which, is, which, is, which is the need of the hour. Uh, as far as our economy is concerned. Of course it is, but I read a very interesting view in terms of, uh, in terms of stimulus. You know, the, if we are able to give a very significant amount of stimulus to healthcare itself, essentially that is going to go a long way as far as uh, the economy, economical revival is concerned. In fact, Honorable Finance Minister in her last budget already has allocated certain percentage of GDP to the healthcare sector. And she's saying that over the next five years, it is actually going to grow exponentially. And I believe it is going to grow even further. It is just not going to be restricted only uh, to five years. It will go further. 
so now coming to how how manufacturing companies healthcare companies would be spending that money or you know where that money is going to go, get invested be driven by stimulus as well as driven by the demand so there are two aspects we talk about right first is the capex investment uh, starting of new plants starting of new lines addition extension of additional capability in terms of uh, it, uh, capability in terms of production especially the pharma companies and the second option is going to be optimization of the current existing capacity because we have enough in, in fact you know india is already known as the biggest exporter of vaccines in the world or vaccine manufacturer in the world so there is significant capacity so some portion of it is going to optimize the usage of that particular capacity especially on healthcare sector uh, the life sciences part pharma part and this is the place where machine learning and ai is going to play a very very pivotal role so when we say machine learning and ai uh, what exactly how, how exactly it is going to add value or you know where will machine learning and ai coming into picture now based on our past experiences working with various api manufacturer or pharma manufacturer we have realized that uh, typically 60 to 70% of the capacity is utilized fully then there are best case scenarios where people use around 80% but on an average we have seen that the capacity utilization of 60 to 70% is uh, is a norm now where does it go maybe your yields are not optimal there are few batches which get rejected because of quality and mind you these are very important metrics actually is when we say 30% unutilized capacity why it is important because if you take any pharma procedure you know the total cycle time is in hours 36 hours 50 hours in case of vaccines in case of bio, uh, antibiotics in case of biochemical processes the duration is even longer we know fermentation typically takes 100 hours for one batch to come out now imagine increase of certain percentage points 10% 15% to the existing capacity without doing any additional capex that is a huge number we are talking about and that is a power of ai and machine learning which can be utilized uh, in this particular sector so let's be a little concrete and see where exactly machine learning and ai will how this is going to pan out totally so if i have to talk at a very very broad level we are talking about uh, you know looking at the end to end process right from raw, entire manufacturing value chain right from raw material part till in process parameters and finished goods fg so we need a mechanism using machine learning and ai which can integrate this data which can look at these processes together and then identify a pattern which can be correlated with the outcome it has produced so the way it will work is let's say you have a batch which has let's say 10 batches which have produced fantastic yield best output so you look at it that for all the patterns through raw material through in process parameters which parameters contribute most when you get a good batch which parameters contribute the most when you have a bad batch and moment you have a mechanism to do this pattern analysis because pattern analysis is not so easy it is just not about looking at the data imagine hundreds of parameters which are continuously changing uh, across hundreds of hours and you need to do this analysis for last 3 months 8 months batches it is humanly impossible to identify such a pattern and that is the power of ml and ai so these algorithms will sift through this information and clearly tell that hey if you follow this patterns or parameters you are going to get a best yield and these parameters are not going to be something out of the blue they will be very much part of your very much part of your validated sops let's say your sop parameter is talking about it should the temperature should be maintained between 25 degrees to 31 degrees so machine learning and ai is not going to tell you that it should be 35 degrees celsius no it has to be within the validated range the which is gxp uh, compliant range the way it will tell is that let's say if your range is 25 to 31 if you are able to maintain between 27.8 to 32 point out uh, of to 27.2 then probably you are going to get the best deal imagine such parameters which are run time given to the operator you know who can actually make a informed decision that okay this is what my machine learning, my, my algorithm is telling me if i change it then i am going to get this much amount of yield 
so amount of empowerment this is going to generate create in terms of production capability increase in terms of yield it's going to be phenomenal and we are at the cusp of it it was this was the need of the hour unfortunately we needed a pandemic to really understand this need but nonetheless now everybody is focusing on it so very very bullish on the on the overall growth story of healthcare or uh, pharma life sciences companies in the days to come so before i sign off wanted to quickly introduce myself my name is suyog joshi and i represent a company called levi uh, we are a essentially data analytics machine learning ai company and we have a product called as golden production run which essentially helps manufacturers identify such patterns and optimize the capacity which is being uh, which is currently lying idle it is with you and there is a good scope of improvement that's what we enable for pharma life sciences companies i hope my session was uh, could add some value to you in terms of knowledge about machine learning and ai where it can be utilized and how much are the benefits thank you very much thank you mr suyo for that fascinating talk the key is indeed not to be threatened by the unexpected and to learn to leverage technology to find innovative solutions at health analytics asia we believe that in order to thrive and not just survive in the post pandemic world we need to invest in data especially health data that is easily accessible to everyone data leads dynamic data editor anuja venkatachalam is a final speaker for today and i'm delighted to welcome her to share with us the possibilities of a data powered future hi everyone my name is anuja and i work as a data editor at data leads i'm very happy to be here at the health of india summit 2021 and i've been invited to give a lightning talk um i would like to take the next 5 minutes uh to talk about crux which is a new initiative that data leads will be launching soon so uh statistical facts about health are often hidden behind large swaths of data for example did you know that only 22.1% of deaths in india are medically certified did you also know that there is a 35% drop in rates of stunting among children aged below 5 years but while the rates of stunting are on the low the number of children with obesity is on the rise did you also know of the large gap in life expectancy between high income and low income countries women in high income countries are expected to live 7.8 years longer than women in low income countries and similarly men in high income countries are expected to live 6.8 years longer than men in low income countries with crux our objective is to make health data more easily accessible to the public so as you might already know gathering and analyzing health data requires time effort and often times technical skills as you need to go through multiple websites and gather data that are often only available in unreadable formats with crux you no longer need to spend your time cleaning and analyzing data you can simply log on to www.crux.in and search among millions of data sets using a simple keyword search what's more we also have infographics that have been created by us after analyzing these data so if you're working on a report or a presentation you can simply log on to crux and download uh, the infographic of your choice for a small fee over the past few months we've also been working on creating dashboards in health we want to synthesize trends especially for diseases such as cancer tuberculosis and coronavirus at data leads we're committed to creating greater awareness about health and with our new initiative crux we hope to create the largest database on health if you would like to support us you can support us by becoming a member do follow us on social media to hear about the launch and if your health organization wants to collaborate on collecting primary data and health please do reach out to us thank you so much for your time have a good day thank you anuja for that sneak peek into data leads soon to be launch initiative called crux the ambition is to be the largest health database in the world with easy access to healthcare data when we launched health analytics asia 
in July 2019. Yes, we'll turn to this month. The idea was to tell healthcare stories driven by data because stories have the power to transform the future. I want to thank all the speakers today for sharing their inspiring narratives. In today's uncertain, fast-changing terms, we need these dynamic measures and positive changes more than ever before. What we did yesterday will not be enough for tomorrow. It's time to reimagine the future. On that note, I will now hand over to my colleague Surbi. Thank you for joining us today for the Health of India series, Maharashtra. Thank you so much, Jisha. Um, and a big thanks to all our Trailblazer uh, Flash Talk speakers for being a part of the series, the first Maharashtra e-summit that we started with today. Uh, uh, excellent, excellent discussions. And I'm, I'm sure like uh, this is like, like Jisha had, had summed it up and said, this is the time to reimagine the future. And this is exactly what we are wanting to do. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we have already overshot on our time. We thought we would wrap it up by 12, but uh, but this is such an important topic that, uh, you know, uh, that actually exceeds the time limit. So thank you so much everyone for joining us. But for uh, anything else, uh, I think first we, I would let Sayyad, uh, uh, talk about the entire session and sum it up. And no, I think, I think, Surbhi, this was really, really insightful. And I really thank, like, all the, all of the speakers who participated. And I think when everyone made a uh, insightful, you know, like a, a point about how we should really look at the future, no matter how bleak the present situation looks. And I, I strongly believe, as we discussed in the first session again, and then in the speakers in the second session, there are solutions, there are solutions, there are solutions to every problem. And the, the human behavior is whether we are ready uh, to share our ideas, to share the, you know, a, a place with other and have a dialogue, start a conversation. When people start understanding each other, they start understanding the strengths of different partners, collaboration happens, and then you start rebuilding and then you start shaping the future. So collaboration is really the crux not a single one, you can say a person or a company or an organization or a ministry will be able actually to deal with the challenges of the future. The future is in collaboration, working together and building strength, you know, picking up key things from one and matching those with others and trying to understand our own weaknesses, of course, but also our strengths. I think we have incredible, incredible space despite of all the difficult and unprecedented situation we are in, there's an incredible space to do new things. And we need to be ready to invest in new ideas, even in the worst situation, invest in human resources and invest in the future. Because uh, as you know, we are calling the whole series, it's like reimagining the future, looking at a larger, bigger picture and seeing how we will reach there. So this was the start today with the Health of Maharashtra, Health of India Maharashtra edition. And we are going to keep this discussion continue. We're going to meet again in some time. And we will really make sure that, you know, uh, we include more and more people and have a more and more participation as well. We, we're really looking at questions today. I was feeling bad. We're not able to take all the questions, but I know we have a very learned audience here, people from WHO, people from ho who run hospitals, who run ministries, young doctors, health journalists, everyone. And I thank you all for actually for joining today. And your questions were just uh, amazing. We just were not able to take them, but we'll make sure in future we are, have more space to have your questions answered and have a discussion. So uh, thanks again and um, be safe, be strong and take care. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sayyid. I think, yes, that is the perfect takeaway for today is uh, collaboration is the key. Um, before uh, we say thank you uh, to everyone, I would want to take this opportunity to thank our partners specifically here for making this possible. A big thanks to SAP and NTD Data Business Solutions for making this possible. Without your support, this wouldn't really have been possible. And I'm sure we'll be able to replicate the dialogue and take the dialogue forward in the other stages as planned. We will do it in seven other states and even more for that matter because right now I think it's important to, to start a conversation on the future of health. On that note, a big thanks to all our speakers, to all our participants for being present here today.